If you have your Bible, go to John chapter number 12 this morning. John chapter number 12. I say this all the time, but today is yet another week why I'm reminded of the importance of preaching through the Bible uh, just verse by verse. This is a portion of Scripture that I don't think I've ever heard a sermon on. There are a lot of famous portions of John. You have the I am sayings of John. You have uh, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead or healing people or the prologue to John, that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. Uh, All famous portions, lots of sermons, but I have personally never heard, best of my knowledge, a sermon on this text, but it's a very important text nonetheless. And so let's read it together, and then we're going to try to understand this. This honestly is a lot of things that Jesus has already taught throughout the course of John's gospel, and they're really compressed in, in, these, in these short bursts, and there's a lot here. I'm going to do my best to give it all to you in one sermon. So John 12, look at verse number 37. This says, but though he, Jesus had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah, which is Isaiah, the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? So the report representing the message, the arm of the Lord representing the works. It's kind of a rhetorical question, you know, who believed the words, who believed the works sort of thing, and and the answer is, is they didn't. But verse 39, therefore they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. So here John quotes Isaiah uh, twice. The first quotation is from Isaiah 53, who hath believed our report. The second quotation is from Isaiah 6, That's the passage where uh, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah sees sees the Lord high and lifted up and the angels and holy, holy, holy. And that episode ends with what John just told us here in verse 40, that God blinds their eyes and hardens their hearts so that they can't see and so that they can't understand. Verse number 42, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus cried, and by cried, does it mean tears or does it mean he yelled? And perhaps both. But says Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I am come, a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say, what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak." Well, winter is around the corner for us, if you haven't noticed yet, with some of the dipping temperatures and the, and the snow on the ground this week. And if you have little munchkins around the house, like, uh, like we do in our household, you know that winter can be four or five straight months of sickness, that one kid can get sick and then passes it to the next and then to the next and the next. And by the time everyone's healed up, then it just starts all over again. And you just, your household is continually sick. And you, I mean, as much fun as it is to lay around sick all day and watch Disney Plus, it's, it's just not what you want to do. So in preparation for this, my wife recently asked her Facebook friends what she should do to try to keep our household healthy. So we began to receive suggestions, you know, wash your hands a lot, drink lots of water, have a balanced diet, oils, no shoes in the house, Clorox wipes, vitamins, probiotics. Pastor Skelly even chimed in with my favorite comment. He said, you should wrap the kids in plastic, immerse them in a tub full of bleach, give them a straw to breathe, and check on them when they're 18. So I don't know that we'll take his advice on that, but I thought it was fitting. One of the suggestions we got was that we should give our kids elderberry juice. Have you heard of these elderberries? You know what this is? Who knows what elderberries are? Okay, most of us do. I was relatively unaware of uh, elderberry juice. I'm still not an expert on this. But uh, apparently they can only be grown between like 
eight, 9,000 you know, feet above sea level and they have to be south facing and they take 13 years to mature or something. I don't know if that, any of that's true. I just know that would be the only reason for why they cost so much. They, 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 have to be, they have to be really difficult to grow or harvest or something because apple juice is like two cents an ounce. Uh, if you want vanilla extract, which seems like it'd be tough to get like juice out of vanilla plant, but if you want extra, and that's like 50 cents an ounce. Elderberry juice, like $87 an ounce. Like it is, it is it's not really a hyperbole, but it's expensive. It's expensive stuff. And you don't even like buy it from the store half the time. Apparently people make this and like, you know, make it into jello or like you can buy it at the flea market in a mason jar or something. And I'm not sure why my wife would do that. But nevertheless, there's a jar of elderberry juice in our house. There's no labels on it. There's no ingredients on it. Like for all I know, a witch brewed this stuff or someone put half grape juice in there and watered it down so they can make more money. I don't know, but it's, it's there and you give it to your children and... I do know this. There's one thing I know about elderberry juice. It's the cousin of motor oil. <laughs> because that's the only explanation for why your kids would react the way they do when they drink it. Like it's, it's as if they're drinking ink from a fountain pen. They do not like drinking elderberry juice. I haven't tried it. Maybe it's disgusting. Maybe it's not. I'm not sure. But I've learned this over the last maybe month of, as we have force fed our, our children this juice of elderberries. That... No one likes to take medicine. I've been reminded of that. Nobody likes to take medicine, but we do. And the reason we do is because we know that it's good for us. We know that internally there is a benefit and that the gain will far outweigh the pain. Now, when I read and studied John 12 and began to understand John 12 even better, I could not help but think that John 12 is just good medicine. It is truths that we don't really want to swallow. Most people are somewhat resistant to what Jesus has to say here. But if you'll take the medicine, it will produce something healthy inside of you. It will produce goodness on the inside if you're willing to do it. So here's the medicine that Jesus is going to give to us this morning. And I started halfway light because the rest of the sermon is not light at all. It's just, no one smiles when you swallow medicine. You just don't. So you're not going to smile a lot today, but it'll be good medicine. So here it is. Four things that we need to learn. Belief and unbelief are not detached from God's plan. We need to learn that you can't know God apart from Jesus. You need to know that you can't light yourself. And you need to know that there is a judgment day. Those, those are our four pills to swallow. So here we go. Belief and unbelief are not detached from God's plan. This starts out in verse number 37. And here is what John says. And he, may, he means for this to be a striking statement. He says, Though Jesus had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Here are a bunch of people that heard the matchless words of Jesus, that saw the beautiful life of Jesus, that witnessed the astonishing miracles that Jesus did, yet they don't believe. And it begs the question, why? Why? He he raised him from the dead. He said these things in front of you. He has, he has lived this life in front of you. Why? And John gives us at least three reasons very quickly in this text. He says in verse number 38, well, part of this is that it was predicted by Isaiah. That Isaiah said, you know, who's going to believe our report? And who, that there are going to be, 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 be people that reject Jesus. He says in verse number 43 that they loved human praise more than God's praise. There were some that had a sort of pseudo-belief. They said, yeah, we we believe and Oh, look what he's saying. And and this is amazing. But they were too scared of what people would think or what people would do or what they would lose. So they decided to clam up and to to not really follow God. But probably most importantly, and the focal point of this text is in verse number 40, where he quotes Isaiah and he says, God hardened their hearts and blinded their eyes. He says, in in case you think I, I made it up, we'll read it again. Verse 39, Therefore they could not believe because Isaiah said, He hath blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Now, I read that, and I said, wait a second. Didn't Jesus just implore them to believe? We just came off of last week. He just left. Like, hey, believe while you have time. Uh, You have light now. You're about to have darkness. I'm about to die. You should believe. He implores them, says, believe. Don't delay. Do this. Believe. Then it says you can't believe. You know, 
Should they believe or is it that they can't believe? Which one? <laughs> this is kind of a, a New Testament example of what you see all through the Old Testament. You see in the story of Pharaoh where Moses is told to go to Pharaoh, let my people go. And we're told that Pharaoh hardens his heart. Then we're told God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And many times they're like two or three verses apart. They're right next to each other. Pharaoh hardened his heart, God hardened his heart. Which one? Did Pharaoh do it or did, or did God do it? Correct answer, Sue. The answer is yes. Totally. You see it in Acts 2. Acts 2, Peter gets up in the first sermon really ever preached on the day of Pentecost. And he says in the same verse, I mean, they're, they're breasts away from each other. Peter will preach and will say that Jesus died on the cross because of the forward nation of God. God predetermined by his wisdom and his counsel, he put Jesus on the cross. He was destined to die on that cross. He was ordained to die on that cross. Be before the world began, that purpose was established. It was absolutely planned. Jesus had to die for the salvation of the world. But then in the next breath, he says, and you put him there and you killed him and you're guilty, shame on you. Did God put him there or did they put him there? Both. You find in uh, many examples of Babylon and Assyria, things like this, where, where God will tell the, the Jewish people, you've been bad, you're gonna be punished. I'm bringing Assyria as a tool in my hand to punish you for your, for your wickedness and for your crime and for your evil. And then I'll turn right around and say, and I'm gonna punish Assyria for attacking you. Like, is Assyria a tool in your hand and you're making them attack Israel or are they doing it of their own volition and now they're gonna be punished? Both. Now, this is a bit problematic, and you're probably struggling here, aren't we? We probably struggle with this because we like to think of the relationship between God's control and God's sovereignty and man's choice and free will as a zero-sum game. Well, generally speaking, we like to think of it as, well, okay, maybe it's, maybe it's 100 zero. Maybe God is completely in control, and, and he does everything, and we're little puppets on a string, and we have no choice in the matter, and, and he's completely in control. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it's the opposite. We have free choice and we have free will and we do what we want and, and God's allowed us this and he holds us accountable for those actions and we're responsible, but God's not sovereign and he's in control. Or maybe, maybe it's a mixture, okay? Maybe it's 80-20. Maybe it's 80% God's in control, 20% us. You know, God ha has a plan and is gonna follow that, but he gives us a little bit of navigation room, right? Like, I mean, choose A or B, but we couldn't choose C, D, E, F, or G because God's in control and he limits us to that. He has 80% of the control. Or maybe it's opposite of that. Maybe we have 80%. Maybe we ultimately make most of the decisions and God just has a little bit of room to navigate and to respond and, you know, drive the ambulance up and take care of the havoc and the chaos that we create. And, and God's an ambulance driver who responds to all the choices that we make. Maybe it's that. And, and the problem with all of those is that it's none of those. It's 100-100. God is, God is in control absolute sovereign be behind everything has a plan but man is is free to choose and and is held responsible for his actions both are presented now i know you're saying how can that be how can that be now true confession okay after a long time in church after decades of being saved after a lot of money spent on theological education and a lot of time studying the bible i'm not sure i completely know how that works just as I'm not sure I completely know how it worked, that Jesus was man and God, both. Not 50-50, 100-100. Just like I'm not entirely sure how it works that there's one God, but that one God is triune. I can't explain that fully, but I know that the Bible presents both fully. And here in this text, you have a harder leaning towards the sovereignty and the control of God and, and God being behind what is happening in this text. But you see both presented in scripture that there, there are two railroad tracks that run parallel to each other, the sovereignty of God and the free will of man, both being presented. And here in this text, I wanna hone in on the pill that you have to swallow that's being presented is more the sovereignty of God aspect. Is, is more of the God is in control of this and God is behind this and, and he's, he's not distant from this. Now this is, it's, it's good medicine. Something that many people, including yours truly, uh, don't always want to swallow, but if you will, it will produce something really good inside that you won't get otherwise. Let me give you an example. We're told very clearly in belief and unbelief that God's plan is attached to that, that it's, it's not detached from that. So we find verses like this in John 12, we find verses like John would write in 1 John, that we loved him because he first loved us, right? What, what does that verse tell us? It tells us 
You don't love God because you initiated it. God doesn't love you because you initiated it. It's not that you gave yourself to God, you surrendered to God, you decided that you were gonna be all in, and so then God decided to love you. No, God set his affection on you. God set his affection on you, and that is the reason that you love him. Now, this is important because if, if you were to go home uh, to your wife, let's say that you're, guys, you're married, you go home to your wife this week, and your wife says, babe, do you love me? I would strongly encourage you to answer the question and answer the question in the affirmative, to say yes, but you know what the next question is. Do you love me? Yes. What's the next question? Why? Maybe how much? Why? Normally. Why do you love me? Now, there's, there's a universe of plausible answers there. You are the prettiest girl in the class. You are the smartest, and I, I love intellectually stimulating conversation. You were a great tennis player, and you know how I love tennis. I wanted recreational companionship, whatever. You can give all these answers, but the answer that she wants, the answer that you want, the answer that God gives you of why he loved you, I love you just because I love you. Not... Well, it was because of A, B, and C, and this provided some sort of tangible benefit to me. And yeah, you really sparked my curiosity and, and you engaged my intellect. And yeah, I did think you were pretty. Or yeah, you were a recreational companion and this did this for me and I got some sort of benefit for this. We really don't want the benefits. We want to know that someone loves us just because they love us. That, that someone has a love for us that's not conditioned by if I'm pretty anymore or not, or if I can swing a tennis racket anymore or not, or if I, if I can read the book still or not. That it's not conditioned by those things. It's just love just because. And, and when you come to just belief in God. You find that he loved us first, that he chose us, that, that it wasn't conditioned by what you did for him, that now all of a sudden I can back up and know he loves me just because he loves me. It's actually kind of in spite of me, not because of me. That in reality, I was enmity with God. In reality, when Jesus said to love your enemies, that he was exhibiting that by loving me on the cross because I was his enemy and against him. That, that he loved me in spite of me. It still put that there, which now can tell me, okay, here, here's someone who's initiating, engaging, loving, pursuing, and, and provoking this inside of me. But now I can sit back, I can relax, and I can know that, you know what? God's love for me isn't conditioned by me. I'm going to mess up. I'm, I'm going to sin. I'm going to be, in my own estimation, a disappointment sometimes to God. But you know what? His love was not, nor is it now, dependent upon my wisdom or my intellect or my righteousness. His love was based on just who he is, that he loved me. His love was older than the stars. His love will outlive the stars. The stars could fall and he'll still love me. That, now, okay, now you're starting to swallow the medicine. Now you're starting to get to a point where, where you're understanding, you know what? My insecurities can melt away. I'm no longer performance driven. I'm, I'm no longer trying to, trying to choose and trying to work and trying to do this and trying to just be me and, 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 and then God will love me. Now I don't have to do that anymore. I don't know what your self-worth is based on. I don't know what your self-esteem is based on. But if you'd like an upgrade, there it is. It's understanding and coupling together. You chose God. You love God. You follow Jesus. Good for you. But that's not detached from God's plan. It's, it's not like he was distant. You weren't a puppet on a string either. Both of those truths are there. And when you start to swallow that pill, you start to understand how beautiful that is. It starts to fortify your heart. It starts to melt your insecurities away. I could give you a whole sermon just on this specific topic to help you see the implications of this. I, I won't this morning because I have other ground to cover. But this, this is something that is good for you. This is something that should help you. This is something that should establish you. This should, it, when you see even the term elect in the Bible, that's meant to lean into the sovereignty of God, chosen. That's meant to be a, a warm blanket for your soul. It's not supposed to be a controversial topic. It's not supposed to be something that people get worked up about. It's supposed to be something that you say, you know what? God loves me. How crazy is that? He loves me. He chose me. That's what elect means. He chose me. He, he initiated here. He pursued. That's something. That, it doesn't mean that I didn't choose him because you did too. But that's something that should be so beneficial for you. That should, that should help calm you. You should sleep better with that. So you see that God's plan, it's not detached from the belief and the unbelief, specifically the unbelief in this text. But it's not detached from that. It is very clear. Isaiah had predicted this. You find this. You can't know God apart from Jesus. For most of you, this will probably be okay. You'll swallow the pill pretty easy because you're probably already there. Some of you, not so much. For our society as a whole, definitely not. This is tough medicine. 
Jesus says in verse 44, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. So look, when you believe on me, you're believing on the Father. He that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. See me, see the Father. He says in verse 49 and 50, I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. And he goes on, same, same sort of thoughts. What's Jesus say? See me, see the Father. Hear me, hear the Father. The converse is true. Refuse me, refuse the Father. Don't look at me, don't see the Father. This is something Jesus has established over and over throughout the course of John. We read in, in John 5 just weeks ago, he that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father that sent him. It's a package deal. You don't honor Jesus, you don't honor the Father. We'll find just here in a couple of weeks in John 14 that no man comes to the Father but by Jesus. That you can't have one without the other. That you can't say, and a lot of people say this, you know what, I believe in God. I believe there is a God. I know God. I'm a spiritual person. I grew up in church. I have strong feelings about God. I believe the God of the Bible even. But you cannot know God apart from his son Jesus. You have to believe in Jesus. What do I mean by that? I mean, you believe in him as your savior and your Lord, that he died for your sins, that he was in fact raised again on the third day and you confess him and, and you make him your master and you, and you tell him that, that he's in control and you believe on him. And when you believe on him, then you have access to the father. Then you have a relationship with the father. That is a package deal. To know Jesus means to know the father. To love Jesus means that you love the father. Receiving Jesus is to receive the father, but to reject Jesus is to reject the father. And you cannot say, you know what, I know God, but not with Jesus. You cannot say, as many in our society would say, you know what, it's all just a bunch of paths leading up the same mountain. Ultimately, you'll find God if there's one there or not. You'll find God if you're there. Go Hindu route, go Muslim route, go Christian route. They don't matter. Just, just you'll find him. You're all pursuing the same thing. No, that's not what Jesus says. Right. When Jesus says, if you will swallow this medicine... This will, he says in verse number 50, produce what the word of God was all about, life everlasting. This will, he says previously to that, this will produce light and darkness. That if you will understand this, believe on Jesus, now you have a relationship with God and you can't otherwise. Now you have everlasting life and a home in heaven. Now you have light and darkness. Now something good, something intrinsic, something inside of you will be produced because of your belief in Jesus. But there's no shortcut to that. There's no other way to that. There's only one way to God, Jesus. It has to be through him. There's, there's, there's no workaround. It has to be through Jesus. Then he says this, we can't light ourselves. He goes 44, 45, see me, see the Father. Hear me, hear the Father. Then he says in verse 46, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. This text says that Jesus has come to take us out of darkness into light. And I think it's important to note that Jesus is not saying you may perhaps fall into darkness if you don't believe on me. Watch out, there's a pitfall out there called darkness. And if you don't believe on me, there's a chance that you'll fall into that. That's not what he says. He says you are in darkness and you will remain in darkness and you will abide in darkness unless you believe on me. Jesus is very, very clearly assuming that everybody in the world without Jesus is in darkness and will stay there. He is saying in no uncertain terms that the world is a dark place and you're not igniting your own light. You do not have the resources, you do not have the power, you do not have the wisdom to solve darkness. You say, okay, what, what do you mean darkness? It's obviously a metaphor. He's not saying the sun will be blackened out and you will you know, never see the sunlight again. It's obviously a metaphor. For what? Well, same thing we use darkness for now. Hopelessness, evil. It wouldn't be uncommon for you to ask somebody who's going through a tough time, hey, how you doing? You know what? It's been really dark, but I see light at the end of the tunnel. What are they saying? You know what? There's hope. That there, it, it's not always going to be this way, right? It, whereas if they said, you know what? It's dark and I see no light. They're saying it's hopeless. I see no way out. There's, not, there's despair here. 
We use it all the time in that way. We use darkness still to this day as, as a metaphor for evil. When Jesus says that without me, the world is a dark place and you're going to remain dark, he's saying very clearly, the world doesn't have the resources for giving hope. The world doesn't have the resources for the problem of evil. You're going to find that in yourself. You need me for that. You need me for hope. You need me for the problem of evil. Now, it doesn't take a genius to just think about, I'm not even talking about the world, just talk about our American society because that's what most relates to you because we're here. The past few years, just in American society, we've recognized hopelessness. We recognize there's evil. Nobody struggles to admit that, you know, we have a drug problem. Nobody struggles to admit that we shouldn't be shooting schools up. We see that, it's plain. And we try to deal with it. And we try to deal with it without Jesus, by and large. Non-Christians do. But what did Jesus say? You ain't solving that problem. What have we tried? Just, just the past few years, here's, here's a couple of illustrations on, on hopelessness and evil. We've tried uh, philosophy. I mentioned this, I don't know, a couple months ago on a Sunday night, but it's too good not to mention again that Bertrand Russell, who is a 20th century philosopher, he's dead now, but in very recent years, one of the most prominent philosophers and, and thinkers, said what a lot of people will say in our society. Science is all there is. Every cause has a natural cause. There is no God. There is no supernatural. Religion's a hoax. Science is all there is. And Bertrand traces that train of thought to its logical end, and here's what he says. These are his words. Man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving, meaning you are not here for a purpose. There is no thoughtfulness behind you. There is no intelligent design that made you. He says his origin, his growth, his hopes, his fears, his loves, his beliefs are all the outcome of the accidental collocation of atoms. They are all destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. Here's what he says. I, I know there's no God. This life is all there is. There is, there is. There's no afterlife. We aren't put here for a purpose. While we're here, we'll do some stuff, but it doesn't really matter. Because in the end, we're going to die. And after a little while, nobody's going to remember us. And after a little while longer, the sun's going to burn up. And then everybody's going to die. And there's not going to be anybody around to remember anything that ever happened. And it's all just going to be a vast extinction of the solar system. That's where we're at. I personally would call that dark. It's a bit gloomy, is it not? I, I think it smells of hopelessness. I think Bertrand would say the same thing because he did say the same thing. He said, he went on to say, only within the scaffolding of these truths and only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. Here's what he says, don't get your hopes up. It is hopeless, it is meaningless, but it's true. So build on the truth that there is no hope and nothing that we actually do is going to matter. Here, here's what he's saying, what Jesus said. Without me, you're dark. Try, try to go around without me. Try to solve hope without me. You can't. Bertrand admits the same thing. We can't. It is hopeless. It is dark. But nevertheless, I think it's true. We tried to solve the problem of evil. Our modern solution to the problem of evil is to basically scapegoat it and to act like evil and sin are dirty words and don't say them and should this attach to you personally where you did some evil or you did some sin then certainly that was because of you know it was predetermined for some reason because of your birth order or, or because of your race or because of the situations of your life and that you don't have to take responsibility for yourself we've taught for uh, basically 50 years the prevailing idea inside of society has been that uh, morality is subjective it started in the 70s and 80s with sex, that there were no rules on sex. It was like the first time in American history. No rules. Just, I mean, you love who you want, you do what you want, no one can tell you. And if they do, shame on them. They shouldn't be so judgy. It's, it's not their business. That's your own choice. You do, as long as you're not hurting anybody, go ahead and do whatever you want in regard to sex. And then we were surprised when that evolved into, into more than that. And we started acting like there were no rules in regard to money or ethics or anything else. For roughly 50 years, 
our universities have told young people who now are no young, longer young people that there is no ultimate authority. Of oh, duh, everybody knows that. There's no such thing as God, God's law, eternal law, our codes, our morality. It's all extremely subjective and extremely relative. It's, it's, it's situation specific. How do you know if you should lie or not? I mean, it depends on the situation. How do you know if you, if you should be moral or not, commit adultery or not? I mean, it depends on the situation. It's, they're all cultural constructs. It's different for us as Americans as it would be for someone in China. It's different for someone in China than it would be for someone, you know, in Uganda. And it, it, they're cultural constructs. You know what happens when you tell people for 50 years that it's all relative and that there are no moral absolutes? Wells Fargo has to fire 5,000 employees because they opened up 3.5 million false bank accounts and credit cards. That finally came to a head, what was that, last year? They, they finally got to the bottom of it. I don't know if they did or not, but they at least acknowledged that there were more than 5,000 employees opening more than 3 million false checking accounts, saving accounts, credit card accounts without customers' acknowledgement. Why? So that they could make more money, uh, make their bonuses, uh, meet the sales targets. That's not like Bernie Madoff, just one dude running off away with people's money. That's systemic. We find out what, when, when you say that things are relative, wouldn't you know it? Facebook admits they're using our data against us. Surprise! Just a couple years ago, Facebook admitted that they, they, had, they had told their advertisers how much time people were watching their ads, right? And they're billing them for this. That they had overestimated how much people were watching their ads and, and had told the advertisers and got paid, overestimated by as much as 80%. Not eight, 80. AKA, we wanted more money, so we lied to you and took your money. That's what that means. Now, whether you use Facebook or not, I don't really care. But, and, and, and it's, it's amazing to me. The culture acts aghast. How in the world could this be? Where have our ethics gone? What, how could they do this to us? We've taught people for 50 years that morality is relative, and now we're surprised when they're not honest? Like, that kind of makes sense to me. Lewis said it best. He put it in different terms, but, but Lewis said it this way. He said, don't laugh at honor and then be surprised when there's traitors in your midst. Right? But we've tried to solve the problem as evil as best we can. We, we, we've tried to rule it. We've tried to government it. We've, we've tried to come up with our own solutions. But you know what we found? We found that what Jesus said is true. You're not lighting yourself. You're not coming up with the resources to solve hopelessness. You're not coming up with the resources to solve evil. You're not doing that on your own. Jesus says very clearly, you need me. Now that's humbling. That's a pill that most people don't want to swallow. That's medicine most people don't want to take. To admit an hour, do it yourself, pull, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, work it out. I'm responsible. The reason I have a good marriage is because I'm a better, you know, I'm just not as big a schmuck as he is with, to, with his wife. The reason that I have good kids is because I trained them the right way and took them to church. The reason why I have a good bank account is because I worked hard. I went to school. I, 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 I. And that, and that environment of our American culture we have to admit, I don't got what I need. I, I cannot, I, we cannot solve this ourselves. We need a light from outside of our world to come in and to light our world and to help us. That's tough. That's a tough pill to swallow. But nevertheless, it produces something good because it'll give you light. Otherwise, ain't no light coming. Jesus said, you will remain in darkness without me. Then he says this. I'm going to put it this way. There's a judgment day. He starts to talk in verse 47. Hear my words and don't believe. I'm not going to judge you. I didn't come to judge you. I came to save you. But then he gets to verse 48 and he says right in, the, right in the middle of the verse, if you reject me and you receive not my words, you have one that judges you or he has one that judges him. What, what's he saying in the middle of the verse? There is a judge. And then he says at the end of the verse, in the last day. So the, the simple truth of this is that Jesus does say very clearly, there is a judge and there is a last day. There is, in fact, coming an end of time and there will be a judgment day. Now once, I hate to keep beating the same drum, but once again, it's something that most people don't want to dwell on. It's something that a lot of people don't even want to accept. 
There's a lot of supposedly Christian people that don't even want to accept this. There are some that will say there is no God and there is no judgment day. That, that's, you know, that's a farce. There were others that say, you know what? Yeah, I do believe in God, but God is all love. And, and there is no judgment there. And they, they make God toothless and they defang him. And Jesus says, there is a judge. There is a last day. And frankly, that's good news. Because part of our dealing with evil, and there is evil in the world, is the fact that we do need a, a fair judge to sort it all out because we're not going to ourselves. The fact of the matter is that if Bertrand Russell's right and that all this is not going to matter and no one's going to remember, then do whatever you want. Who cares? What's it matter? <laughs> no one's going to remember anyway. There's no, there's no consequence. There's no everlasting punishment. There's nothing to that. If there is, though, suddenly you, you have hope for what the world actually recommends as far as love, peace. Most of you in this room have been wronged. Most of you have been wronged in some fairly significant ways by people you loved, by people you thought were your friends. Most of you have. I dare say most of you in this room have not been wronged to the degree that a lot of other people throughout the course of history have. There may be one or two in here, but most of us don't know what it's like to have your village plundered and your daughters raped and your family executed and left. But that has been a reality for a lot of people throughout the course of history. And our solution, or what we advocate to people, is no, don't take vengeance, don't retaliate, be peaceful, have love. Why? Just because? I'm, so, I'm sorry, but if that's me, that is not enough to make me unclench my fist or drop my weapon. It's not. But if there is a judge who you know on the last day will right every wrong, will redress every evil, will make sure that every sin is paid for, and he will do it perfectly, and he will do it proportionately, and he will make sure that it is just if you know that there's a judge who's going to judge it all, then you may have strong enough medicine for your heart to let go of your bitterness, to let go of your hurt, to let go of your wound, to unclench your fist. But without that, I don't know how you can tell a world to live in peaceful harmony. I don't know how, how it's even remotely possible. But there is, there, that's good news, but there is bad news coupled with that. Because the reality is, as much as we want God to be the right judge and to measure out whatever vengeance he seems fit and to do that on the last day, and I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to sit on the throne. I can take the gavel out of my hand. Let God be the judge. We also know that God will judge us then, correct? Oh, and yeah, they may be worse than me and they may have committed more atrocities than me and they may be fitting of, of more punishment than me. And God knows that. That's essentially what Jesus says when Jesus says, hey, I'm not going to judge you, but my words will judge you. What you know and the knowledge you have and, 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 and what, you've, what you've understood, that's going to come to bear on you. So he's going to be fair on that, and he acknowledges that. But we know that, that then we stand in line for judgment and that we're not innocent puppies. We like to think we are, and I'm, you know, all of us, generally speaking, lump ourselves in with the good people. I don't know who the good people are to you. Maybe, maybe it's the conservative people. Maybe it's the religious people. Maybe, I don't know. But you lump yourself in with the good, maybe it's the American people, whatever. But we know deep down that we ain't the good people. I love the illustration that Francis Schaeffer gave. He said, and this isn't how it works, by the way, but let's just pretend it's how it works. He said, Let, let's pretend that you have an invisible recorder around your neck. And all it does is record every time you say, you shouldn't, they shouldn't, I would if I were them. All it does is record the standard that you hold the rest of the world to. That's it. Which is an extremely low bar. Far lower than the holiness of God. All it does is record your own imposed standards on other people and then God just holds you accountable to your own words. Who doesn't quiver? All of us know that we do. All of us know that we don't even measure up to our own words, much less the word of God and the holiness of God. 
So the question is, if this is good medicine, okay, I swallowed the pill to, to get rid of my vengeance, the judgment day of God, but now it produces fear and anxiety and worry, and I'm going to stand before God one day. How do I know that I'll be on right standing? How do I know that I won't get a death sentence? How do I know that I, I'm fearful of that? Well, Jesus solves it for us. Jesus says in verse number 47, if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Here's what Jesus says. I didn't come to judge you. I come to save you. Here's your hope. Here's your light and darkness. Here's your solution. Here's your everlasting life. I didn't come to bring judgment on you. I came to bear your judgment. I didn't come as a judge with a spear in my hand. I came, as a, I came as one bearing your judgment with a spear in my side, with nails in my hand. I came to take this from you, not put this on you. I came to absorb this. The, the one person who has the right to condemn says, I will be condemned for you. The one person who has the right to judge says, I will be judged for you. That The light of the world is on the cross being plunged into darkness. He says, I will do this on your behalf. This is what the whole text of John 12, if you've been tracking the last few weeks as we preach through this chapter, the whole text has pointed to this. I'm going to die. Now's the time. I'm going to fall on the ground and be buried. I'm going to die for you. I'm here to save you. It's, it's all pointing to that to say you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about Judgment Day. Yes, on Judgment Day, every sin will be paid for, but I've already paid for yours. Believe on me. Put your trust in me. Don't look at me as your judge. Look at me as your savior. And then, and only then, you don't have to worry about the last day. You don't have to worry about what the Father will pronounce. You can know that, that you're a beloved son. You can know you're his daughter. You can know that, that he has affection for you. You can know you're part of the family. You, you can know that this does not have to produce anxiety. This can produce a security that I have saved you. Not because you're worthy, not because you did something special, because I did it for you. And this, this whole text, and whether or not this medicine produces something good inside of you or not, hinges yet again on the very concept that you have to believe on Jesus. If you do not believe on Jesus, run from these words. I don't blame you for not wanting to swallow that medicine. I don't blame you for wanting to spit it out of your mouth. But if you'll believe on him, you'll find that it's good medicine. You'll find that a judgment day is not something that you need to be petrified of, but it's something that you can have security around. And know, as Jesus ends the passage, verse number 15, all these words, the words that my father gave to, gave to me, is life everlasting. I'm here to offer salvation and life everlasting. So I'm done. I'm end it with this. Can you take the medicine? Can you understand that God is given us a choice, certainly, but he is in control and he is not detached from belief and unbelief and there's a plan and that you can lean into his sovereignty and you can find security there? Can you take that? Can you swallow the pill that you're not going to know God apart from Jesus? It has to be through him. There's only one way. Can you understand that you're not going to like yourself? You're not going to solve the problems yourself. You need Jesus for that. You have to humble yourself for that. Can you understand that the only way you stand in judgment day, the only way that you have right standing with God is to put your faith and your trust in the one who took your judgment, your sin, your condemnation, your shame, and took it all away if you'll put your faith in him.